everybody and welcome to another day of Hollow Week. I really hope you guys are enjoying this little series I put together for you guys for the week before Halloween. I definitely wanted to keep the missing persons case on a Saturday as I typically would so you only have one more video after this and I'm honestly a little bit sad about it because I've had so much fun kind of putting together all these different types of videos and I'm super excited that today is a missing persons case because I feel like I'm really taking it back to the roots of my channel. So today we're going to be talking about a very mysterious Halloween vanishing that honestly is very unsettling and there's not a lot of information in the case. I haven't seen a ton of coverage on the case and all in all it's just very odd um, and that is the disappearance of Hyung Jung Cindy Song. Now most of her friends refer to her as Cindy. I think her family for the most part referred to her as Cindy as well so that's how I'm going to be referring to her for the rest of my video. So Cindy was 21 years old when she went missing on November 1st 2001 from State College Pennsylvania. Cindy was originally raised in Seoul, South Korea, and she ended up moving to the United States in 1995 to live with her aunt and uncle in Springfield, Virginia. She was just a normal child, she got good grades in school, and then after graduating high school, she enrolled in Pennsylvania State uh, to major in integrative arts. So that was something she was really excited about and she went on to live in State College where she attended school, made lots of different friends, and then everything kind of changed on October 31st, 2001. So as any other college student, Cindy planned to go out that night. She was going to go drink and party and have fun with her friends. And they went to a Halloween party at Players Nightclub on the 100 block of West College Avenue. And at around 2 a.m., Cindy and her friends left Players Nightclub and decided they wanted to have a few more hours of fun. So they actually headed over to a friend's house where they played some games, they drank a little bit more, hung out. And at around 4 a.m., they decided to fully call it a night. So her friends actually went to drop her off at her state college apartments on the 300 block of West Clinton Avenue. Now they had been drinking that night, but no one was overly intoxicated, so they kind of didn't really stay to see if she got inside. They weren't worried she wouldn't be able to. Um, it wasn't known to be an unsafe location, so they dropped her off and just kind of left and assumed that she made it in the apartment. But unfortunately, no one really knows what happened to Cindy after this. It took until November 4th for someone to really realize that they hadn't been able to get in contact with Cindy. A few of her friends didn't find it too odd, you know, their school, they're doing things, they get busy. But when she literally stopped responding to everybody and not a single person had heard from her, they decided to go ahead and file her a missing person because at this point, they knew they dropped her off at the apartments, but had no idea if she got inside, and it wasn't like her at all to just stop communicating with her friends, um, stop showing up to school, all of that, so she was officially known as a missing person. Authorities immediately went to check her apartment because this is the last place that Cindy was known to be, and she had left all of her personal belongings behind. Everything that was of importance to her was still pretty much in the apartment. She had left behind her backpack that she had used for school that day. She left behind her cell phone, and her cell phone was off, so they decided to turn it on, and they noticed that not a single phone call had been made from her cell phone at all from her apartment from the moment that she was dropped off at her apartment. So it's literally like she was dropped off and then she vanished. And they even actually found the eyelashes that she had worn as part of her costume that night. So that night she was actually dressed as a bunny. She had on bunny ears and a pink tank top and had done her makeup and was wearing false eyelashes. And because the eyelashes were found inside the apartment, they assumed that she did in fact make it in there, but they have no idea if she left willingly or if something else happened to her. Now the one thing that kind of pushed more towards the idea that she left willingly was that the only things missing from her apartment was her wallet with her ID and her bank cards and all of her money and her keys were also missing and there was not a single sign of foul play in her apartment. There was no sign of forced entry. They haven't specifically stated that the door was locked but because they haven't stated it wasn't and that there was no sign of foul play or forced entry or anything, I'm assuming that when they went to the apartment, the door was locked, indicating that she left, locked the door behind her, and then vanished sometime afterward. 
So because there was no sign of a struggle and there was an indication that she did get in the apartment and there was an indication that at some point she left, they kind of questioned around her friends and family if there was anyone she would have left with or anywhere she would have gone at around four in the morning. And her friend said that there was apparently a 24 hour store only about a six minute walk from her apartment. So her apartment is kind of at the end of kind of a dead end street. It does turn off at the end of the street, but she was on like the dead end side of it. And she would have had to walk down the street, cross a decent sized intersection, and then walk across the street again to this little shopping center. And her friends actually said that she would make this trip to this 24 hour little store at any time, you know, in the middle of the night, early in the morning. She would really go whenever she needed to, as long as she really needed something. So they started to wonder if she did leave to just take a quick walk to this little store. So they checked her bank cards to see if there was any history of that, and she hadn't used her bank card a single time since being dropped off at her home. So then they decided to go to this little store itself and see if they had any sort of surveillance footage that showed Cindy coming in to the store, they tried to see if anybody recognized her, maybe saw what she was buying, if she was with anybody, but unfortunately from what I've seen, no one remembered seeing Cindy in the store that night, and by the time they got there to try to look at footage, it had already been recorded over. So any evidence they might have had that would have shown and really solidified the idea that she left to go to the store that night was now completely gone. Authorities decided to kind of branch out a little bit and look into to other possibilities. Maybe someone followed her in the apartment, like they were walking in right behind her. Maybe somebody somehow got into her apartment without really having to break in. Maybe they had a key. Maybe, you know, she accidentally left the door unlocked. But they really would have had to create a lot of ifs in this story because there was no sign of foul play. And if she had been followed in and attacked by somebody, there would have been a sign that something happened somewhere. And then the likely attacker probably wouldn't take the time to grab her wallet and her keys and then lock the door behind her. And from what I've seen, she didn't have a car, so she wouldn't have been able to really drive anywhere. Um, so it was just really, really confusing. And authorities, unfortunately, didn't have a lot to go off of because this this was pretty much all the information they had, all the evidence they had. Cindy's family said that she had no plans to travel that month, so it wouldn't have made sense for her to kind of go off and go travel somewhere. Um, they said she definitely wouldn't leave anywhere without telling someone that she was leaving or going somewhere, even for the shortest amount of time. So then they started wondering a little bit about her mental state, because Cindy had actually broken up with her boyfriend just the month before. And they wondered if maybe she wasn't handling it as well as they thought she was and she decided to for some reason run off from the grief and being upset over it and end her life or possibly just run away. But immediately her friends came back and said, there's absolutely no way, we've been around her, we've watched this process, we've talked to her about it. And Cindy apparently wasn't really upset at all about this breakup. Obviously she was upset to a very normal, typical extent, but nothing to the point where she seemed depressed or overly upset or like she couldn't move on. She was going out, she was having a great time, she kind of had a small grieving period like normal people would do. So once the family really talked to the friends about this and that she wasn't grieving, they all kind of came to the same idea that there wasn't anything else other than that that would have been affecting her mental state um, or her willingness to run off somewhere. So at this point, they really think the only idea is that some sort of foul play was involved. So her family from there decided it was time for them to fly from Seoul, South Korea to State College, Pennsylvania to see if they could find her themselves and to really help out with the investigation and the college actually welcomed them in. They gave them a place to stay, like room and board, everything. So they comfortably were able to come and stay. And they ended up accidentally kind of destroying any potential crime scene. Keep in mind when I go into this that the authorities had never labeled this apartment as a crime scene. It had never been considered one. There was zero sign of foul play. They had gone through the entire apartment already. There was no sign of a struggle, no sign of forced entry, as I said. So technically, her family was able to come in and do whatever they wanted. 
but at this point they also weren't 100% positive what happened so they probably should have kept her apartment blocked off for a longer period of time but unfortunately hindsight's 2020, and at this point since nothing was pointing towards something really having happened to her in the apartment they let the family in and her family actually ended up cleaning up the entire apartment and basically as the case went on and it became more likely foul play was involved there was no way for authorities to now go back to the apartment and try to find any more physical evidence which i don't think they necessarily would have found anyways but you never really know and now it was like 100 percent there's no way anything could be found period so authorities continue to do the very typical steps in the case they ruled out the family first they ruled out all of the friends close to her they ruled out acquaintances they ruled out people in the apartment but they still couldn't really determine if it was foul play or if she had just willingly left. And then they got their very first significant tip from a woman about 200 miles away in Philadelphia. Now this witness said that she saw a young woman that seemed to match Cindy's appearance in a vehicle with another male. Now apparently they were in the Chinatown district of Philadelphia and the woman that looked like Cindy was screaming for help. And so this bystander, this woman, walked up to the situation and immediately this man like jumped in between them and said, you need to go, you need to leave, like mind your business. And I think it freaked the woman out a little bit. She ended up just leaving, but she did call police to tell them about this incident and said that she strongly believed that this young woman very well possibly could have been Cindy. So obviously this is the first big tip. So authorities jumped right on it and they went out to Philadelphia. They went looking for this man. The woman described him as a man with like olive to light brown complexion and he had medium length hair, but that's really the best description that she could give. So they weren't able to find this man anywhere. And then the woman's story also started becoming less and less reliable because she started switching things up, information started changing, and it was changing so many times that they started to wonder if she had just fabricated this entire story. And they really wanted to stop trusting her in general, but because it was the only lead they had and it was such a bizarre story, they still to this day are searching for this man, but they kind of put this tip to the back burner. So they essentially were led all the way back to square one. Authorities started wondering if maybe Cindy's disappearance was drug related because when they were searching her apartment initially, they found a diary that she had kept and they went through the different entries to the diary to see if maybe there was some Thing suggesting she was planning to go away or suggesting she wanted to end her life, um, talking about any strange experiences that she might have had with someone. But the one thing that they found didn't actually relate to any of that, but it said that her and her friends had been experimenting with marijuana and ecstasy. So they started to wonder if maybe that night she had taken some other sort of drug, had a very adverse reaction, and maybe just like ran off in a distressed mental state basically. But they talked to the friends, they spoke to everyone that she was with that night, and they really started, you know, going through different stories. And there was nothing at all that suggested any drugs had been used that night. They had just been drinking, and she wasn't even, like, full-blown intoxicated. Um, so they just really had to dismiss that theory. But it kind of ties into a potential other theory later on. So about a year went by and no more tips came in on Cindy's disappearance. So Unsolved Mysteries decided to air a segment on her and they really hoped it would bring back some sort of life to this quickly fading case. Because a lot of people were confused and upset about it. This is a small college town and everyone knew about her disappearance. It seemed that despite how odd this disappearance was, there just somehow were no answers and it was really upsetting a lot of people. So they aired the show, but it really didn't lead to any more tips until one. And it didn't even come from this segment, I don't think. They were actually led to their first possible person of interest, a man named Hugo Selinski. Now Hugo Selinski was a bank robber, a known criminal, and it was very possible he had something to do with her disappearance. When I say this man had a record, I mean it. He is a trip. 
He had started getting in trouble with the law when he was 15 years old, pretty much didn't stop. I don't know how old he is now. I think he's in his late 30s, possible early 40s, um, but he spent a massive amount of time in prison and in jail throughout his life. He even escaped from jail at one point, kind of during a lot of the investigations into him when it came to Cindy and other things. And his backyard is actually known as the graveyard for bad guys. So if that doesn't tell you the kind of person he is, you'll just kind of see deeper into it. On June 5th, 2003, an informant named Paul Weekly, who had run-ins with the law and then kind of like became an informant, and this is actually, I think, something Hugo did for a period of time, but either way, he came forward and led authorities to Selensky's backyard, where he claimed Selensky told him he had burned and buried two people. Now, when they arrived at Selinsky's home, he seemed very confused as to why they were there, and he ended up being immediately arrested for aggravated assault and burglary against a man named Michael Kurkowski Sr. Now, remember that name. So the reason they were led to this house originally is because Michael Kurkowski Jr. and his girlfriend Tammy had gone missing about a year before. And Michael Kurkowski Jr. was a pharmacist and was potentially linked to selling drugs, like prescription drugs. So basically, Paul had been told by Hugo Selinsky that he had killed and buried Kurkowski Jr. and Tammy in his backyard. So he had assaulted Kurkowski Sr. and potentially killed Kurkowski Jr. It's confusing, I know, hang in there with me. So when they went to dig in this yard to find maybe Kurkowski Jr. and his girlfriend, they did end up finding them buried, but they also ended up finding three other bodies, something they totally weren't expecting. Two of the bodies were drug dealers in the area and the third was never positively identified. Now, it could have been identified since then. I personally couldn't find if it had. Um, I do know that it was not ever identified as Cindy, but for a while it was really this question in the air of, is this other body Cindy? Are there other bodies in the area? But I'll really get into that in a minute. So in 2008, he was cleared of the two other murders of the drug dealers, but he ended up going back on trial in 2011 for the murders of Michael Kurkowski Jr. and Tammy. But the informant during all this, during all these trials after all these years, and keep in mind that in 2003 is when Paul Weekly came forward with this information about the bodies, it took until like one of these trials for it to come out that he had more information. So Paul Weekly said that Selinsky also killed Cindy and he didn't do it alone, he did it with Michael Kurkowski Jr. I know, this is like this giant circle of confusing mess. According to Paul Weekly, Selinsky told him that he, along with Kurkowski Jr., went to State College that night and actually stumbled across Cindy Song. Now I've seen a couple of different versions. I'm not exactly sure where this information's come from, so don't quote me on it. I've seen that they've mistaken her for a sex worker and they kind of attacked her and grabbed her and abducted her. I've seen that Kurkowski Jr. just really liked different ethnicities when it came to women that he was with. So I've seen a whole bunch of different stories, but either way, they abducted Cindy and brought her back. I've seen a couple of other different versions of where they brought her back, assaulted her, and then killed her, and then buried her somewhere in Luzerne County, which Selensky's home is like either on the outskirts of Luzerne County or in Luzerne County. I've also seen that they kept her in safe in his house until she died. I've seen a whole bunch of different things, but basically the story is they grabbed her, brought her back, killed her, and she's buried somewhere in Luzerne County. And then to top it off, Selensky told Paul Weekly that the reason he actually killed Michael Kurkowski Jr. to begin with is because he found out Kurkowski Jr. had actually kept Cindy's bunny ears as a souvenir. And this really pissed off 
Zelensky because he didn't want to be linked back to the crime at all and he thought this was just like going to take them down and he was mad at him for keeping them and not telling him so he killed him for it. Now there's a lot of other different theories on why exactly Zelensky killed Krakowski Jr. We do know that Krakowski Jr. had something to do with selling drugs like pharmaceutical drugs. I know that he introduced Zelensky to his father saying that he was a trustworthy person. Um, I think his father became like the middleman and then something went wrong. Honestly, I have no idea, but they say there is a huge possibility that somehow this all links back to Cindy. So because of this ongoing trial with Zelensky and his possible involvement with Cindy's disappearance, authorities weren't really able to say a lot. So they kind of put out this one article during Zelensky's, I think, first trial saying it's highly likely he had something to do with Cindy's disappearance. And then their mouths are pretty much permanently shut. So they put out this information and scared everybody, but then the courts actually put a gag order on them because the trial was ongoing. So this actually ended up creating a pretty big controversy in all of State College, especially with minority groups in the actual college itself and then in the area, because they felt that authorities really weren't doing what they should be doing with the case. They pretty much were just sitting back and not investigating it at all. Um, it caused a really big uproar for a really long period of time. And honestly, I feel like people just didn't quite understand that they were doing what they could. There was just no information. And um, on top of that, with this gag order, they couldn't release other things that they had. And we've kind of talked about this before, about how a lot of the times it will seem like authorities aren't doing anything. And there are some cases where that is just the case. But with this, when you have such little information paired with a gag order, it's definitely going to seem to the public that nothing is happening, but that's not the case here. So I feel like people were just very critical of them, but it was very misdirected anger and frustration. Um, and it's just a lot of misunderstanding of what they were having to go through as authorities legally to protect her case. And I feel like not enough people understand that, that you have to protect the integrity of the case, especially, like, especially in a situation like this, where one of the persons of interest that you think might be connected is already being charged for other murders. You could so quickly, totally mess up getting any justice for someone that's left out like Cindy if you say too much, put out too much. Um, it just wasn't something they were willing to do. So, that pretty much blew over pretty quickly. Um, I know a lot of people kind of still talk about it, the fact that it was quiet for so long, but honestly, there's just no information. So one thing that was kind of frustrating and authorities didn't know what to think when it came to Zelensky is that all of the information that Paul Weekly had given about Zelensky, for the most part, up until Cindy, had a ton of backing. They were able to go and check to see, and they did find the bodies. Everything that Paul Weekly had told them had been true, but it seemed like Cindy's story that he told them didn't have like a lot of good backing. It just seemed almost like it was fabricated or just created either from Paul Weekly or from Hugo Zelensky. So Cindy was not one of the bodies found on his property and all the people that we know of that he had murdered, he did just bury in his backyard. So that means he would have totally had to go off from what he normally did to bury her somewhere else. Also on top of that, Hugo Zelensky lived two and a half hours away from where Cindy went missing. A lot of people were really hesitant to think that, you know, maybe he went all the way to State College and then brought her all the way back that night. But what I will say is I think at this time he was like in his late 20s and State College is a college town. It's not that uncommon for people to travel to like college towns, like fun little areas for Halloween where there's going to be parties and a lot of activity. So I don't think honestly that's too odd. Um, and it's not out of the realm of possibilities, especially because it's only two and a half hours away. But also on top of that, it kind of came out after all the other information from what I know, and that could just be because they decided to release them at different times. But it seemed almost like maybe Paul could have been on a high of capturing Zelensky in the murder of two people because, again, 
Paul Weekly was also a criminal. I don't know what exactly he did. Um, and when you're given recognition for helping out as an informant, I'm sure that feels great, especially when you're known for being the criminal usually. So a lot of people wondered if maybe he was just on this high. And since Cindy was broadcasted all over the news for a good period of time, if maybe he just really wanted to connect him to something else to get more recognition. And then a lot of people also wondered even if that wasn't the case, even if Paul really did hear from Celine that he had in fact murdered Cindy, you know, what if maybe Zelensky had lied about it? You know, Cindy again had been all over the news, the story about the bunny ears, they easily would have known about it because the most circulated picture of Cindy is this one with the pink shirt and the bunny ears. You easily could create a story off of that picture alone and knowing that it was Halloween. And on top of that, it was convenient that the only person left was Zelensky to talk about this story. And then his supposed uh, partner in crime was now deceased. So a lot of people weren't really sure what to believe. And then a lot of people also questioned if maybe the drug use idea that authorities had originally kind of come up with wasn't totally out of the question because it seemed like Zelensky and all these people were heavily involved in drugs. What if Cindy and her friends just so happened to get involved with them somehow through the grapevine and one thing led to another and that's how they all became connected. So there's just a lot of theories out there around the possibility that Zelensky really could have been involved, but there is absolutely no evidence to prove this whatsoever other than what Paul Weekly said. Now, Zelensky is serving a a lifelong sentence in prison for the murders of Michael Krakowski Jr. and Tammy. He was not found guilty of the other two and I don't know about this random fifth person. I've still not been able to find anything on them but I do know that the other two he was definitely convicted for and he is still in prison. So they haven't been able to figure out where exactly Selinski was that night. So they're not able to confirm or deny if he was possibly in the area because they simply cannot prove anything, which just makes this more frustrating and confusing. But they do refuse to rule him out because of the fact that Paul Weekly had been told the truth by Selinski a few other times. So there's some very obvious theories here. One that she, for some reason, decided to go out after she got home. And again, I kind of talked about the idea of wanting to know if the door was locked and my assumption that it likely was because I feel like authorities would state her door was unlocked, anyone could have got in. But since they so quickly ruled things out as foul play or a sign of a struggle in the house, I just honestly believe the door was likely locked. And since she took her keys and her wallet, it makes sense that she left, brought the keys to lock her door, brought her wallet to go and buy something real quick. Now, the only issue, especially her friends and family have with the story is that she wouldn't ever leave her phone behind. But authorities have said her phone was off and if she had had it all day and all night while she was out, it's very likely that the phone was just dead and she didn't bring it because she had no use for it. But even then the friends say that while she would go out to the store all hours of the night, there's no way she would have gone around 4 a.m. without her cell phone at the very least. On top of this, the walk to the store, it was a very secluded street that she would originally walk on from her apartment, but there were shopping centers kind of all around once she got to the intersection. And being Halloween night and people being out and partying very, very late, I don't find it that out of the realm of possibilities that maybe the wrong person was just kind of lurking and waiting to find somebody. Um, it's a great night to be out on the prowl unfortunately and on top of that something that I really question and I haven't seen a lot of people comment on when I was on Google Maps I saw quite a lot of motels in the very close vicinity and I don't know if those existed back in 2001 at all I cannot verify this but if a lot of those still existed especially on Halloween night that's also a great night to be out looking for girls to traffic so that's also a potential um, motels are known a lot for holding women that have been captured to be put into trafficking um, until they can move them so there's just a whole lot of different possibilities here on top of that because it was four in the morning if she had been snatched up by someone on her walk I feel like not a lot of people would have seen it because 4 a.m. is kind of like this limbo hour because most bars at least where I am close around 2 obviously that's very different for other places sometimes 
Um, and so either people at that point are out and totally intoxicated and under the influence of something and usually aren't going to leave where they are, or you know they've already gone home hours before and are now asleep. So there probably weren't very many people out except for a very random few, meaning if she was snatched, I don't find it that odd that maybe no one heard it or saw it. So that's literally it for her case. And there has been no movement on it, no nothing ever since then. I don't see any recent information on the case. There's nothing further into Selinsky's possible involvement. And it's so incredibly frustrating because I feel like she left no sign behind. Like there is nothing that's been left behind to point towards whatever could have happened. And a six minute walk seems so short but the list of possibilities that could have happened between there and the store are absolutely endless. Like there's big parking lots, there's gas stations, there's businesses someone could have just been sitting in and seen it as a prime opportunity to attack her and take her. And it just makes me sick that there's someone out there that has known for these 18 years where exactly she is and what exactly happened to her and they're just out there living their life knowing that not bringing it forward not feeling any bit of remorse for it and i think it's absolutely sick so definitely tell me your theories down below i i don't know whether to think Zelensky is possibly responsible for this or if some other random persons out there is just responsible i feel like her story was you know covered pretty decently right after her disappearance so i think it's very possible all of the stories that Zelensky said were made up or paul made them up so I don't know. Let me know what you guys think down below. I want to say thank you so much for taking the time to listen to Cindy's story. Her story is really not covered very often anymore, so definitely don't forget to share it with people that you know. And don't forget to hit the subscribe button down below to become a member of the Howland fam so we can hopefully bring them home together. And I'll see you guys in my next and last Halloween video. Bye!